Chris's story is awesome. And actually there's, there's quite a bit more that you didn't get to see right there. And what's really cool about his story is that it's not over yet. I mean, like God willing, there's still a lot to be written in his story. And that's something that you and I love to do. We love to write our own stories, don't we? That's, that's very American, isn't it? Like, hey, nobody's over me. I've got to say for me, I'm writing my own story. Okay, cool. Well, here's my question. When you write your own story, do you have editing powers? Like if something, if something goes wrong or man, like, I don't really like that part. Let me edit that. Or can I, I'm just going to erase this part of my story. Like, when you're writing your own story, can you do that? Do you have editing powers? Now, of course you can't go back. We all know that. Your past is your past. You can't change that. But what about the present? Like, what do you do when you're facing something really embarrassing? Because I'm assuming that you're like me and that you have plenty of embarrassing stories. Please tell me you have embarrassing stories, right? Don't leave me hanging up here. All right, we're on the same boat, all right? I've, I've got a car story like Chris does. Mine's not cool though. It's lame leaning in towards pathetic. So it was either the second or third year of us being married and, and Kelly and I were having this conversation and I really don't know how it came up, but it came up that she had never changed a flat tire before. And I was like, wait, 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 wait a second. You've never changed a, a flat tire before? And she said, no, I, I don't know how. Well, this is an opportunity for me. This is a chance for me to shine. I'm gonna show her how to change a tire. She's going to be so impressed. She's going to think, wow, how blessed I am to be married to a man like that. <laughs> who needs a knight in shining armor who rides in on a white horse? My husband can do something far more manly and heroic than that. He can change a flat tire. Like I, I was really building this up in my mind. Then I started to talk myself up to her. I was like, whoa, babe, take it easy. It's all right, calm down. I know, I know, this is simple, I've done this many times, let me show you how to do this. So we go out into the garage and we go to my souped up, like I had an awesome ride. It was a 2003 Grand Dam. Yeah, some of y'all remember those cars, right? Awesome was very sarcastic right there. So we go out to my car and, and I show her, hey, here's how you change a tire. I get the jack out. First thing I tell her is, hey, you gotta make sure that the jack is under some solid piece of the frame. You, you can't put it under anything that's flimsy that, that might break like the door. You can't do that. So I get the jack out and I start to put it under the car and I start to jack it up. And she stops me almost immediately and says, wait, 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 I, I don't think that you did that right. I, I think that you put that under the door. Please, Kelly, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I didn't put it under the door. So I jacked the car all the way up and it's sitting all the way raised for about 10 seconds and we start to hear some cracking sound. And she says, wait, wait, that doesn't sound right. I ignored her like I didn't hear it and, and that she was crazy. Just kept going, got the car up and then all of a sudden, boom, car comes crashing back down. I mean, like bouncing on the tires. The jack shoots out from underneath the car, slams into the wall. Like, I'm, I'm lucky it didn't hit me in the shins. That would have been a really, really bad morning for me. Not only, when, not only did it slam into the wall, the jack also ripped part of the quarter panel right off the side of my car. <laughs> so my wife, who had never changed a tire before in her life, pointed out what I was doing wrong, the very thing I said not to do, and I just ignored her because like, I got this, I'm not gonna screw, screw this up, I've done this before. So uh, God bless her, she held it together as long as she could, and then she just busted out laughing. She just, I mean, so not only was my ego hit already, this got even worse. So I handled it a little bit differently. Um, I was humbled and got pretty ticked off. So I just went inside and hid. And I refused to admit what actually happened. Like I refused. I said, no, no, no. There, there was something wrong with the jack. It was the jack's fault. It, was, it wasn't me. I didn't put it under the door. I absolutely put it under the door. And then I just lied about it. Like no joke. I just lied. When, when people would ask me, bro, what happened to your car? I was like, man, I got hit in a parking lot. And they're like, seriously? And I'm like, did they leave a note? And I was like, nope, they didn't. <laughs> like seriously, I just flat out lied about it because I was so embarrassed. And, and messing up your car because you do something dumb, that's one thing. But what do you do when you do something a little bit more embarrassing or something that's actually shameful? What do you, like what do you do then? Well, there's a story in John 8 that takes shame, man, to a whole nother level. 
Last year, we started this series called The Way, where we're walking through the Gospel of John, and we broke it up, the series, we broke it up into seasons. Last December, we finished season one. Today, we're starting season two with this story in John 8. So listen to the story. Jesus returned to the town of Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back at the temple again. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him. They were trying to trap Jesus into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. So let's get some context here. This is first century Israel and they've been living under the Mosaic law that was laid out in the Old Testament for about 1,400 years at this point. And the law said that if anyone's caught in adultery, they should be executed. That's intense. Like that's the culture, that's the law that they live under. So these guys, they want this woman stoned. Different type of stone than we think of here in Colorado, okay? (laughs) Just seeing if you're all awake. Some of you are just catching up to that one, right? What they want is for her to be pelted to death with rocks. And they've got an ironclad case. That's what the law says. She got caught. Adultery, it means death. But there's actually a lot more going on here. The law also required that the man and woman both who are caught be executed. So why isn't the guy here? I mean, maybe he was a really fast runner. Maybe. Maybe. But these guys could care less about that. They don't care about that at all. They don't care about the law. All they're trying to do is use this woman as bait in their trap for Jesus. Here was the trap. If Jesus says that she should not be executed, then what they'll say is that he's breaking the Mosaic law. That's a big deal. You don't do that, especially for a rabbi. See, they call him teacher. You definitely didn't do that if you were in that esteemed position, let alone Jesus, who actually came to fulfill the law of God. You can't violate the Mosaic law, so they'll they'll point him out on that. Or if he says, you know what, yeah, she should be executed, well, that's gonna really discredit the reputation that he's earned for being compassionate. On top of that, they'll go report him to the Romans. The Jews were under Roman rule at this point, and the Romans would not allow the Jews to carry out any of their own executions. So if Jesus says, hey, you know what? She should be executed. They're gonna go tell the Romans, and then they'll get arrested. That's how they're gonna trap Jesus. One way or another, either he's going to discredit himself or the Romans are gonna arrest him, and that's how they're gonna get rid of him. Now think about this woman. Like I imagine she just got thrown in on the ground She's sitting on the ground with her head hung low. She's not saying a word. She just got caught red-handed. She knows it. There's no denying it. There's no talking her way out of it. And she also knows that she's about to be killed from this crowd because of it. And if that's not bad enough, think about how she must have felt right before she knew she was gonna be killed. She just got caught in the act of adultery caught in the act, and to make it worse, she got drug out in front of a massive crowd of people, easily hundreds, if not thousands. This was at the temple during one of the biggest Jewish festivals. There would have been hundreds, if not thousands of people. She gets drug out there, thrown in front of all of them so they can all see who she is and they know exactly what she just got caught doing. So for you, picture the most embarrassing, shameful, destructive, damning, shady thing that you've ever done. Picture that moment in your mind. Now imagine you get caught doing it. There's no denying it. You can't cover it up. You uncomfortable yet? And then to make it even worse, you get drug out in front of a huge crowd of people so everyone can see you and know exactly what you did. How do you feel right now? Matt, I brought a friend today. What are you doing? Can you make this a little lighter? (laughs) Like, I get it, I get it, but hang with me. Because these are not just stories. The Bible is real. And if you want to experience it, you've got to experience the reality of it. So put yourself in that moment. How would you feel? 
how do you feel knowing the consequences that are gonna come from this? That's the context for this woman. All right. They were trying to trap him into saying something that he couldn't use again, that they could use against him. But Jesus just stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his fingers. They kept demanding him uh, to give them an answer. So he stood up again and he said, all right, but let the one who's never sinned throw the first stone. And they stooped down again and he wrote in the dust. That's a mic drop right there, if there ever was one. Now, maybe this is your first time ever in a church before, but I'm guessing that you might have heard that statement in some form or context before. Whoever hasn't sinned, go ahead, throw the first stone. There's so much packed into that. There's so much packed into that. First of all, Jesus just leveled the playing field. Yeah, this woman's guilty, but all these people over here in this crowd, they all thought they were innocent. Romans 3.23 says something different though. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Key word being all. It doesn't say just some people have fallen short. It doesn't say just the people who have done really messed up stuff have fallen short. It doesn't say just the people who have committed adultery fall short. No, it says all. That means this woman and every single person in that crowd holding a stone. It also means you and it means me. These are the two characters that Jesus is interacting with. One is a woman who's holding on to a scarlet letter And the other is a crowd of people who are holding on to stones. And we can do the exact same thing. We can either hold on to stones. I mean, either or, maybe we do both. Maybe we're holding on to stones. Let's start there. We're holding on to some different stones. Maybe it's the stone of self-righteousness. I mean, that's a huge stone to hold on to. And if you do, I get it because that's the one that I can fall into really easily. And self-righteousness is not just a religious thing. It's not just for the Pharisees. In fact, we live in a world that's full of self-righteous people, both Christians and not. Like, you don't have to be a Christian to be self-righteous. And it starts with you feeling really good about myself. Man, look at all the things that I've done. Or at least I'm not like this guy who keeps screwing stuff up. Or I haven't done this. Or look how good of a person I am. This just fuels, this pride just builds this self-righteousness in you. So you're holding onto a stone, ready to throw it at anybody who doesn't live up to your level. Or your expectations. Or maybe the stone that you're holding onto is some cultural narrative. Whatever the latest cultural narrative is, if somebody doesn't go along with that, then the crowd is really quick to start throwing stones could be a narrative based on feelings or some agenda. And if you don't go along with the crowd, they're gonna turn on you also and throw a stone at you. Or maybe the, cold, or maybe the stone that you hold on to is comparison. You just really like to play the comparison game. Compare yourself to this person over here. And if you're honest with yourself, the more you compare yourself, the more you realize you're losing to that person. You're losing this comparison game. So all that does is fuel this insecurity that you've got. So now you pick up a stone and you're holding it, waiting for that person to screw up. The one you keep comparing yourself to, the first time they mess up, you're ready to chuck a rock at them to knock them down and bring them back to your level. Like Those are just examples of different stones that we might be carrying. Whether it's self-righteousness or pride or comparison or some kind of cultural narrative. Man, it's easy for you. It's easy for me to do that. It's easy for us to act like every person in that crowd holding on to a stone, ready to throw it. That's one side. Or maybe you're like the woman in this story. And you're just wearing a scarlet letter. A scarlet letter from something that you did. Or something that you're doing right now. Or maybe it's from something that was done to you. And you're embarrassed about it to say the least, but in reality, you're ashamed of whatever it is. Maybe the scarlet letter for you, it's a capital A, like the woman in the story for adultery. You cheated on your wife. You cheated on your husband. And the shame you feel from that is just intense. And you just feel like you're walking around with this capital A pinned to your chest all the time and you can't get rid of it no matter what you try to do. Or maybe that capital A stands for addiction. You've just struggled with drugs or alcohol for longer than you want to acknowledge. And there's embarrassment and there's shame attached to that. And the way you play it off is to be really self-deprecating. You get trashed and then later on you trash yourself. <laughs> That's just who I am. I'm that guy. I'm just being consistent. 
That self-deprecation is just a defense mechanism to make you feel better about yourself. Or maybe that capital A is for abuse. And you were abused years ago. Physically, verbally, emotionally, spiritually, sexually. God forbid that's happening to you right now. And there's times where you think, for for some reason you think that, hey, this is your fault for some reason. And because this is my fault, then why do I deserve to be loved by anybody? Because this thing has happened to me. And the shame from it just feels unbearable from, from the abuse that you suffered. Or because of the abuse you've caused somebody else. Or maybe the scarlet letter is being divorced. You just feel like a massive failure because you've been divorced. Yeah, maybe it was your fault. Maybe it wasn't your fault. But you're just embarrassed by it. And there's times when you're alone, and especially when you're with other people who are married, you just feel like you have this capital D pinned to your chest. Or maybe it's a capital S for sexual sin. It could be, a, could be adultery. Could be pornography. Could be because you have a high body count. Could be because of what seems like constant lust. Could be because of sex outside of marriage. You, you just carry this shame from your sexual past and or present and it feels like you have this scarlet S attached to you. Or maybe the scarlet letter has to do with dark thoughts. Have you thought about suicide before? And you're ashamed because you've thought about it or because you've attempted. And the reason you thought about it was because you feel like a disappointment to you or to someone else. Maybe you didn't live up to your own expectations or somebody else's expectations. Maybe somebody flat out told you at one point, you're a disappointment. And if I'm a disappointment, then what's the point? Why would I ever be loved? Why would I ever be accepted? What's my purpose? which just feels more dark thoughts that you're ashamed of. Or maybe the letter's a C because you committed a crime. Maybe you spent time in jail. Maybe it's a crime that nobody else knows about. Nobody else knows. They might not ever know, but you're so scared and you feel ashamed because of it. Or maybe the letter's an L because you lost everything. You lost your investment, you lost your savings, you lost your business because of a deal that you shouldn't have been a part of from the get-go, but greed or pride got the better of you and now you lost everything because of it. And it's negatively hurting other people. You're just embarrassed. Or maybe the scarlet letter's an A for abortion. Like you had an abortion and now there's regret, pain, Shame, and you're so scared that somebody's gonna find out about it. Because if they find out, what will they think about me? What will they say? Man, are you like the woman in this story where you're carrying around some scarlet letter that you're embarrassed about or that you're ashamed of or that you're afraid of what it might cost you if you get caught or if you get found out? Well, if that's you, then think about this. All right, Jesus is saying, I, I, like, I know she's got a scarlet letter. I know, I know she has sin, okay, all right. But let the one who's never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with this woman. Then Jesus stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Like when Jesus says, whoever is without sin, they can throw the first stone. He was talking to that group of people, that self-righteous group of people who were holding stones. That's who he was talking to. But that's not who he's talking about. Jesus is talking about himself right there. The one who has never sinned is the one who's saying it. 
He's right there. All these people are frustrated by what he said. They're, they're walking away one by one, dropping those stones, disappointed at what he said, and they're leaving this woman just with Jesus. This woman wearing a massive scarlet letter in that culture is about as worse as you could do. They leave her alone with Jesus, the one who is without sin, the one who can throw a stone. He's right there staring right at her. Her head is still hung low with shame. Jesus absolutely could have thrown a stone at her. He could have thrown multiple stones, but he didn't. Why? Like he said, he didn't, he didn't throw anything at her. He decided to forgive her. Like that's the exact opposite of what he should have done. What's that say about Jesus? It says that no matter, no matter nobody is more sin, severe against sin. Re hear me on this. Nobody is more sincere against sin and nobody's more compassionate towards sinners than Jesus. Neither do I condemn you. That's grace. Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Neither do I condemn you. So this statement is not just to the woman in this story. He's saying this to you. That's grace. Then he says, now go and sin no more. That's truth. The truth is you have sin. Like so do I. We all do. And the bad news is what sin actually does. What our sin does is it causes death. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve because of my sin. Not just a physical death, but because of my sin, I deserve an eternal death, which is separation from God. That's what the law does. The same law that these guys brought up, the law that said this woman should be executed, it says the same thing about you and about me. The law condemns us. The law is God's standard, and his standard is perfection. Anybody here perfect? Anybody want to raise their hand? I just want to give you an out now. Yeah, none of us, right? What that means is the law condemns all of us. So it doesn't matter what your effort is, your effort, your performance, you being a good person, you have no hope based on any of those things. Those things actually condemn you. You need somebody to be perfect for you. Man, I can't help but thinking about the thief on the cross with this one. It's such a fascinating story. Like the thief on the cross, Jesus, when he gets crucified, there's two other guys, two convicted felons, both thieves, they get crucified with him. One on each side. Jesus is right in the middle. And at first, like they're cussing Jesus out. They're making fun of him. They're mocking him. Like they're about to die too. Like, bro, like, bro I don't think you have much to say right here. Like you're kind of in the same boat. But they're mocking Jesus. But at some point, one of the thieves, one of the guys on the cross, he turns. He just turned. And he makes it into heaven. Like this, this, this dude never got baptized. This guy didn't go to church. Man, he wasn't reading his Bible. He didn't tithe. He wasn't serving on Sunday mornings on a team. He wasn't, doing, he wasn't part of a small group. He didn't do any of that, but somehow he made it in. There's a Scottish preacher named Alistair Begg, and he tells a hypothetical story about this. I think, that, I think this is awesome. Hypothetical. So this thief gets up to heaven and, and he, the first angel he meets, the angel comes up and is like, hey, excuse me, sir, how'd you get here? And the thief was like, <laughs> I don't know, but this is awesome. And the angel's like, what, what do you mean you don't know? And he's like, I, I, like, I have no idea how, how I got here, but man, this is legit. I'm gonna go get my boss real quick. Do you mind just chilling here for a second? Hold on, let me... Let, Hold on, I'll be right back. So he goes in, again, this is all hypothetical. He goes and gets a, another angel and this angel comes back and he's like, okay, excuse me, sir. Um, how did you get here? He's like, I, I, I told you, I told this guy, like, I, 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 don't, I don't know. He said, okay, do you mind if I ask you a couple of clarifying questions? Um, are you clear on and do you understand the doctrine of justification by faith? And the dude's like, bro, I have no idea what you just said. No clue. Okay, um, how about this? Um, do you understand the doctrine of the inerrancy of scripture and how that's the authoritative word of God? Again, like I, like, I don't even have a Bible. Like, I don't know what you said. Okay, well then, sir, how did you get here? And the thief, the thief says, the man on the middle cross, he told me that I could come He told me that I could come and I believed him. 
That's the good news. 1 Corinthians 15, three says this, Christ died for our sins. Because remember, they gotta get paid for. The wages of sin is death. They've gotta get paid for. Jesus' death is what paid for them. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, and then he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. They called the shot. He was seen by Peter, and then by the 12, and after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. What he's saying is that, hey, I know this resurrection thing sounds crazy, but it's not a hoax. Like, yeah, I, I get it. It's really hard to grasp or grasp that somebody actually rose from the dead because I'm pretty sure that's never happened in the history of the world, but this actually happened. We're not making this up. And if you don't believe us, there's still hundreds of people alive that saw him after the resurrection. They touched him. They talked with him. They laughed with him. Go ask them. They'll tell you if we're lying or not. So because the resurrection is real, that means your hope is not in you. Despite living in a world that tells you your hope is in you. Don't buy into humanism where it says, hey, the answer lies within you. Look in you, believe in you. You can be your own God. There's no hope there. There's also no hope in politics. I don't care what happens at the next election cycle. That's not where our hope is. There's no hope in the next social movement or narrative. Our hope for salvation is found in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. He died for you and then he was raised from the dead three days later for you. That means Jesus is who he says he is and he said that he's God. That's the good news. So the Romans occasionally, they would have a famous general get captured in battle. And whenever that would happen, they would negotiate with the enemy to get the general back. And they would negotiate, they, they want him back, they want to get his return. So the, the word they used to describe that process of getting their general back, you know what the word they used to describe that was? Redemption. They were going to redeem their general and get him back. That's what the crucifixion and the resurrection is for you. Jesus came first to glorify God the Father and then to redeem you, to get you back. So in this story, in no way did this woman's sin diminish Jesus' willingness to get hurt for her to save her. And the same thing is absolutely true for you. In no way does your sin diminish Jesus' willingness to get hurt for you, to save you, to redeem you, to get you back. And then because of the resurrection, Jesus has editing powers. Like, yeah, your past is still your past. That can't be changed, but now it can be redeemed. Whether you have a past that's full of scarlet letters or self-righteous stones. So right now, it's time for you to drop the stones whether that's self-righteousness or pride or comparison or cultural values and error, whatever it is. If you're holding on to any stones like this crowd was, it's time to drop them. And at the same time, if you've got any scarlet letters, it's time to drop those too. A scarlet letter from abuse or addiction or loss or dark thoughts, like whatever your scarlet letter is, you don't have to hold on to it anymore. Like you can drop it now. And maybe you're thinking, well, all right, cool, man, that sounds great, but how do I do that? Repent and be baptized. If you're ready to believe in Jesus, put your faith in him and follow him, then repent of any sin that you got. Repentance is not a condemnation thing at all. In fact, it's an act of grace. Repentance just means to, to let go of any sin that you've got, grab hold of Jesus. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin and then turn from it, run away from it and for, run and follow Jesus and then be baptized. In baptism, what you're saying is, hey, I'm all in, I'm all in. Jesus is my Lord, he's my savior. Yeah, I got a mess, yeah, I still have questions. He's my Lord and savior, I'm gonna die to myself to follow him. So right now, wherever you're at, because all of us have something, it's time to drop your sin, drop your shame, drop your self-righteousness, and drop any scarlet letters you have. Watch them sink to the bottom of that tank and you come up to live a new life. So that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna do baptisms. There's some people that are planning on it already. And then some of you, you aren't planning on it, but it's time. Man, if you've been wrestling with this for a while, if you've been there, like, I don't know, if God's tugging on you, you had no idea, this is your first time here, and you're like, I wanna respond, let's go. We've got people backstage that will talk with you, they'll pray with you, answer any questions you've got. We have clothes for you. We have brand new underwear, if you, that's what you need. Like, we're, we're not gonna give you used drawers. We're not gonna do that, all right? We got everything you need, we're ready for you. So if you're ready to respond to Jesus,
follow me through that door right now. Let's go get baptized. Let's go.